Hi, I'm Dave Kassler, and I'm the author of the story of the Great American Flying Broomstick, and I'm going to be reading to you a short excerpt from Book One, Genesis. I came into Ridgeway high and from the north. Holding my breath, I scanned the scene below. The town looked normal, but as I descended into the town park, I could hear more noise. As I mentioned, my sunglasses are not the best prescription-wise, my eyes having aged a bit. I stopped somewhat north of the park, hovering about a hundred feet above the town, surveying the scene below me. I heard shouts of, there he is, and where, and is he coming here, and things like that. The park wasn't full of people, but it wasn't empty either. I gave up trying to count, but it looked like there were maybe 200 people swirling around madly. I could see that parking was a real problem. Highway 62 was completely blocked where it went by the park. I pulled out my cell phone and called Randy's cell number. It's about time you got here, said Randy. I heard shouting in the background. Well, what's the deal, I asked. Looks like a mob scene down there. It is. Where are you going to land? Uh, where's the TV crew? By the tennis courts. They've been interviewing the people who saw you land this morning. Where are you, by the way? I don't see you. Where are you? With the TV crew. I have your crutch. I've been giving them a little background information about you, like how you're totally crazy and things like that. I'm swinging to the east. I'm north of the park, over the town shop buildings. There was silence for several seconds. Randy swore softly into the phone. So you can fly. Yep, I'm afraid when I land, everyone's going to rush me. It's possible, but all the law enforcement is right here. We'll clear the area. I thought for a moment. Let me do a couple runs around the park to satisfy people's curiosity. Then I'll land in the middle of the parking lot by the tennis courts. How's that? I heard Randy consult with someone, with more noise in the background. That's fine. Hover for a while until we've cleared a spot. Cool. See you on the ground. I concentrated on the little buttons and put the cell phone safely back in my fanny pack. It has occurred to me since it's a wonder I never dropped it. But as I don't make a habit of dropping cell phones, I guess the thought never came into my head until just now as I'm writing this. I moved closer to the ground, hovering at maybe 50 feet. The noise was deafening since I was hearing everybody at once. Children ran in the street just below me near the post office, completely oblivious to traffic. I cringed. The town looks different from the air in the daytime. The thing that caught my attention, which had escaped my attention completely on my recent nighttime visit, is that the city is crisscrossed by wires, power lines, telephone lines, along every street crossing at every intersection. It occurs to me that wires and brooms don't mix. Do not fly into a wire. I decided the prudent height for my circuit around the park would be treetop height, which is about twice the height of the utility poles. Counterclockwise seemed best, since this put me over Lena Street in front of the True Grit. I descended. People rushed out from under the trees, shouting incoherent babble repeatedly. I tooled south. The children followed me as though I were the Pied Piper. I turned left over Sherman, which is Highway 62. Traffic was at a complete halt. People were getting out of their cars right on the highway and pointing their cameras at me. I managed to wave. I went east on Sherman to Railroad Street and looked down, searching for the TV crew. They were there, and it looked as though they had their camera aimed at me. TV vans are interesting affairs. You can tell the relative prosperity of a TV station by how fancy its van is. This was a rather paltry affair, a 40 Econoline van emblazoned with the TV station logo and fainted paint. One fender, the front left, was crumpled a bit. I didn't see any kind of satellite antenna, so they must be taping things and then would have to get back to Grand Junction to do anything with it. I checked my watch, 2.35 p.m. They had at least a two-hour drive ahead of them, more if they obeyed the speed limit, so the earliest they could get back was only a little before the 5 o'clock news. I'd better hurry.